Romans chapter 8, a great book. We're in chapter 8 right now. I do want to review this because we are, I don't want to say switching directions, but we're continuing with this understanding. Uh, chapters 1 and 3 are talking about the universal sin problem. First in chapter 1, it talks about all mankind is suppressing the truth. They know the truth, but they're suppressing it. And that judgment is, is inevitable for them. The next part of that section goes into the Jews. Well, the Jews, they're different. They've got the law of Moses, and they're trying to, they're trying. And Paul says, you know, even the Jews are taking mankind, chapter, when we talk about general man in chapter 1 and 2, general man takes the revelation and suppresses God's truth and conforms it into an idol. That's what I just got them talking about. Our generation has taken God's revelation in nature, and instead of embracing the concept of a creator with the NASA space program, and embracing the concept of a creator with all the medical advances, embracing all the scientific advances, look, there's some kind of a creator here, embrace that. They use it, they form it into an idol to teach what they want to teach. They form all the truth into an idol. An idol is a false ideology, a false religion, a false worldview. And they come up with all kinds of false concepts. And that's what chapter 1, they, they make images out of the creation that's supposed to reveal God. They use the creation to suppress some truth and create their own images. That's general man. Well, the Jews are different. Well, they, instead of taking the general revelation, they take the Mosaic law and form it into an idol and start trying to, instead of hearing the message of the Mosaic law, instead of seeing the God of the Mosaic law, they take it into some kind of a, a legalistic alignment so they can somehow find loopholes so they can continue to live evil, sinful lives, but justified according to their law. Jesus dealt with that. When he talks to them about the leaders, about the sins they're committing, but yeah, they've got laws that they've created to justify their sinful behavior. And so... Universal sin, if it be the Gentiles, if it be the Jews, you are in trouble. And you're not going to get, you can't work your way out of it. You can't be good enough. We know this. Chapter 3, verse 21, ends that section. Chapter 3, verse 21, and this again is review. But now, well, I'll read chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, because of chapter 1, 2, and 3, therefore, this whole book just keeps flowing. After chapter 1, 2, and 3, no one's going to be righteous. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law, whether through the law, but through the, through the law we become conscious of sin. So we realize, if you're honest, Gentiles realize, and that's what it says, God's wrath is being revealed. When mankind tries to, if they do embrace God's reality as a Gentile, they realize there's nothing else out there except wrath from God. And the law, oh, we're failing. There's wrath. What God is trying to reveal to mankind is not he's loving and forgiving and kind and just forget it. I'm, I'm patient. There's nothing bothering me. What God, chapter 1, 2, and 3, what God is revealing to the Gentiles and the Jews is he's angry. The wrath of God is being revealed, which means you should be going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to turn all the truth into some kind of an idol say, oh, God is loving, kind, patient, peaceful. He's not mad at anybody. Everybody gets to go to heaven. There you did it. You, took, you suppressed the truth. The message from God is wrath. You suppressed it, came up with your own idol. He loves everybody. No one's going to suffer. Okay, that's idolatry, for example. Okay, so now chapter 3, verse 21. But now the truth, a righteousness from God apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So at the end of this whole problem, where the wrath of God is being revealed, and you're all going to face it, God reveals another one, Jesus Christ. You can avoid this wrath with faith in Jesus Christ. And so now chapter 3 begins talking about chapter 4. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. And God, in chapter, if we go into chapter 5, you're going to be justified by faith. And you say, well, so all you've got to do is believe in Jesus. All you've got to do is accept Jesus. All you've got to do, you realize God's revelation is wrath in nature. You realize God's law, the Mosaic law, is wrath and anger. And you're in trouble. You've got the sacrificial system. What are we going to do? He's going to send a man to save you. And the man is 
Jesus. Psalms talks about this. The Mosaic Law talks about this. Genesis talks about this in the garden. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Adam and Eve, your hope is going to be in one of the descendants of mankind. One of the seeds of the woman is going to be the answer to your problem. From the very beginning. What do we need to do to fix it? Well, I'm going to give you ten rules that you've got to follow. Not going to help. you just got to say you're really, really sorry and don't eat from the tree again. You are in trouble. You're buried in sin now. But a man from Genesis through the prophets, through Psalms, all the way up to Jesus' ministry, and now in Romans, faith in Jesus. So this faith in Jesus is greater, or the grace is greater than anything you can do. That's, the, that's this next point right here, chapter 5. Sin is great. Right, but sin is something produced by man. God is greater than sin, and God has offered grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So in every situation, it's not a matter if you can earn it, not a matter if you can contain it or maintain it, it's a matter of if you will receive Jesus Christ, if you'll place faith in Him, your sin will be all paid for by Jesus, and you'll be saved by grace. Well, what happens if I sin worse? Paul ends that section. Grace is greater than sin in every situation. If you believe in Jesus, if you are in Christ, now see, in the human mind, wait, 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 wait you mean this has got a loophole in it. That means all i got to do is say I accept Jesus Christ and I can just keep on sinning? Well, I guess if you misunderstood what I said, but yeah, grace is greater than sin. And that, that's where chapter 5, we're justified by faith. Not by what you do, not by who you are, but who you trust in. It always comes back to a who. Last week, we talked in chapter 7. Who will rescue me from this body of death? It wasn't what will rescue me, it was who. It comes back to Jesus. Once again, from Genesis, through the Psalms, through the prophets, through the Gospels, through the epistles, in the book of Revelation, it's who will save you. It's Jesus Christ. It's not a system. It's not a doctrine. It's not a belief. It's, or it is a belief. It's a belief. It's a trust in Jesus. So we're justified by faith. Grace is greater than sin. And so that chapter ends, and as you know, I'm still reviewing here. Chapter 5 <clears throat> ends with this. Chapter 5 going into verse 6, or chapter 6, first verse of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul, if what we understand, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, and sin's no longer an issue. That's right. So we can just keep on sinning and we get more grace. Well, that wasn't the point. Because what we're looking for is being justified by faith and realizing that we don't have to be burdened by sin, that we're set free. But now what we want to do, now that you are in Christ, is now we start talking about sanctification. You want to start growing in Christ. You want to start becoming what Christ has set you free to do. And now we've got this law. Here comes the issue of the law. <clears throat> the things required by the law to produce sanctification are no longer an issue. Don't try to follow the law. Don't go after sin, because sin is going to send you the wrong way. But don't go after, well, I'm going to, then I'm going to start following this law. Here's a huge, this is, this is, a, this is very relevant. Talk about, I mean, this kind of teaching can keep the church out of the mess it's in today, in our culture. Because you can just hear the evangelicals today rattling around, because it's in their mind, it's in their thinking. We uh, disagree with sin. What church is going to promote sin? Well, I guess I'm... So instead of the sin, they're going to promote, these are the things we do. We, we are going to, this is our standard of Christianity. And if you haven't, again, it's, it's always going to be at a beginner level, because you want the beginners to be able to reach it. One, you read your Bible every day. Two, you don't use bad language. Three, and again, if you're actually reading the Bible, you realize number two is of no effect, because you just, just don't read your Bible in the original language, and then, you know, or whatever. And you got this list of rules, and, and most of them always end up with somebody like, and always respect the, uh, the authority of the pastor. Uh, yeah, yeah, always got trouble with that one. But anyway, you got this list of rules. That means you're qualified to be a member of the church. Well, it's like right there you are. Now you're back into the law for your local church. And it's not about Jesus Christ. Well, you say that, but it's about this law. In chapter 6, Paul is saying, well, we end chapter 6. He's talking about sanctification. Chapter 6, verse uh, 15. 
he's talking about sanctification, but throwing the law under the bus. Because the law puts you back into a system of trying to attain what Jesus Christ is, who, what he's done for you. I mean, this is, I mean, this, I mean, even right now, this is radical stuff for most Christians. Chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? I mean, I just erased this list. That's not the point. So you just tell a Christian they just sin and rebel against their pastor and use bad language and live in rebellion? No. I'm saying we're under grace. We're, we're in Christ. We're not going to have freedom to sin. But you're not going to have, you're not going to need to have a law to suppress your behavior. You're supposed to be embracing something. You're supposed to be growing. You're supposed to be growing in Christ. And so chapter 6 is talking about sanctification and talk, getting rid of the law. Now chapter 7 we talked about last week. Let we go to chapter 7. And I know this is review. <clears throat> chapter 7 uh, begins, verse 1, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men with, who know the law, that the law has authority over man only as long as he lives. And he's going to use the illustration of a wife who's married to a man, but the man dies, and now she's free to marry another man. And Paul is using this as an illustration. This was the law. This now is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Or this is life. In Christ, or this is Jesus. This is your born again position. Once Christ died, you're in a sense are free from this law. It is no your Christianity, your relationship with God is no longer based on you obeying a law. This law has died. Who died? In this illustration, Paul uses the man died. In our illustration, the wife died to the law. In other words, the man is still left over here, and the wife has gone on and is free to marry someone else, a new man. It's legal. And she's free to marry the spirit, the life, the, uh, to Jesus Christ. She's in a new way of life. And that's what I ended last week. The problem is, this wife wants to make her new husband happy. And that's what the Christian, the Christian wants to make God happy. The Christian wants to make Jesus happy. Wants to do what he, they're supposed to do. So they want to be productive. And Paul is about to tell them, there's a new way of productivity. It's going to be life in the spirit. And again, that's dangerous in our Western culture as we take a life in the Spirit and made it mystical. We've made it goofy. We've made it, ooh, you know, are you there yet? No, I'm still seeking the Spirit. Paul's, no, it, that's, that's doctrines of demons. Now you're going into the demonic world trying to have some spiritual reality. It's like you are in spiritual, you are living in God's time right now. We'll talk about that. But if you're trying to live this new way of life, how do I make God happy? You go back to your former husband conceive a child, and give birth to the child of the law. It's like, what? I wasn't happy with the law in the beginning. And now you've gone, Jesus is saying, you've gone back to the law, produced some legalistic work, and says, look what I did. I've now stopped doing this. It's like, you're just, you just went back, you're just, see, you're just seeing the law on the side. I don't want you, you are dead to the law. Stop talking about the law and let's talk about us. Let's produce something together. Well, I need the law so I can produce something. No, we're not following a list. We're following a way of life. And I ended with this illustration last week. Chapter 7, well, let's go ahead. Oh, chapter 7. Uh, Paul in chapter 7, verse 7, what shall I say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except for the law. The law is holy, righteous, and good itself, but it's not your way of life. Now he goes on and he talks about himself struggling with sin. We talked about that last week. During this phase right here, even though he's got this new life in Christ, and this is, it all relates to all of us, it relates to Paul as, even as, as an apostle, as a born-again believer, you're struggling with this same thing called sin. And he explains that because sin is alive in you. Although you've been born again, justified by faith, you are now living, trying to live this sanctified life with the Spirit. There's something right there beside you the whole time. It's called sin. And Paul says, when I want to do good, sin is right there with me. And that's where, that's, that's, that again is a huge doctrine the church needs to be explained to. You're never going to get to that place where you just no longer sin. Or you're no longer tempted by sin. 
You renew your mind. You live your life with the Spirit. You turn, produce things with, as, as a believer. But there's always, for until the day you die, there's going to be this thing called sin who's alive in you because you're just, in the natural, you're a seed of Adam. You've got it with you. You're going to have this temptation. You're just going to have to recognize, well, I don't know what's wrong with me. Nothing. And Paul ends this right here by, in chapter 7 saying this. Chapter 7, verse 24. What a wretched man I am. He's not talking about an unborn a, a, a unbeliever. He's not talking about when he was a, a, a Jew killing Christians. He's talking as an apostle, writing text of Scripture to the big church in Rome from Corinth in 57 AD. While he's facing the problems in the Corinthian church, he says, what a wretched man I am. Now, right there, that disqualifies him from the ministry. He's, he's admitting right there. He's having trouble with sin. Well, why, I think you should probably resign from your position, deal with it, maybe see some counseling, and then maybe we can put you on the road to recovery, and maybe someday you can be a greeter in the church or something. But if you're dealing with sin, uh, then you're unworthy to be a leader in the church, especially an apostle, and we should probably burn this book because it's infiltrated with, with sin. I'm being facetious. Paul says, what a wretched man I am. And we know Paul dealt with sin from examples in the book of Acts to this right here, his own testimony. And we know he didn't get delivered from it because in Philippians he says, not that I've already obtained perfection, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. In other words, I press on not to follow a law, but take hold of that for which my new husband, my, my, my new spiritual life took hold. There's something bigger out there. I haven't obtained it yet. I'm still pressing on. And here it says right here, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. We know it didn't happen in time because he says right here, thanks be to God, the answer, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's going to rescue Paul from this body of death? You read into the doctrine right there. It's going to be at the resurrection. When he is resurrected into the new state. When he is resurrected into his resurrected body. Who's going to rescue him? Jesus Christ. The same one who justified him by dying on the cross. The same one who is sanctifying him while you're producing fruit. Jesus tells the disciples, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will produce fruit. You separate yourself from Jesus and you start following a law, you're dead. You're now stuck with yourself and what you can produce, which is nothing but sin. So, sanctification. You stay, you're saved by faith in Jesus. You're sanctified by life in Jesus. But who's going to deal with this sin nature I got? Thanks be to Jesus Christ. It's always going to be a who. Thanks be to Jesus Christ, who will rescue me from this body of death. He says right here, I read it again. What, shall, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And so he's saying, I've got two laws here. And we're going to pick this up in chapter 8 now. There is the law of the Spirit. The new way is the law of the Spirit. And that's where Paul's got to live. But that does not mean the law of sin has gone away. I ended with this illustration last week. There is the law of gravity in the natural world. This is an illustration, not from the Bible, but I think it captures the point very well. The law of gravity. You take this pile of metal, you take it up off the top of a building somewhere, and you drop it, it's going to fall. Call it fiberglass, call it whatever you want to call it. The material, it's going to fall because the law of gravity is there. But you can make that pile of fiberglass, the pile of metal, the whatever it is, you can make it fly because of the another law that is at work in our universe called the law of lift. If you form that, again, I did this last week, I'll do it again, there's an airplane. If you form it into, an, I don't know, Form it into an airplane, and you get it moving fast enough, that same pile of metal and fiberglass will start to fly in the air. Now, someone asked a question at the end of class last week as everyone left, and I, this helped explain my answer. Because the law of lift is working with that flying plane at a certain speed in a certain shape, does that mean the law of gravity no longer exists? We have not neutralized, we have not, no, we have not eliminated the law of gravity. The law of gravity is going to stay here 
until this planet is done, whenever that is. But we've overcome the law of gravity with the law of lift, or the principle of gravity with the principle of lift. Even as this plane is flying, is it feeling the effects of gravity? Gravity, even if it's flying, gravity is still pulling on that plane. There's just a greater law in effect. If that plane suddenly stopped moving, the law of lift would cease to operate, and what would take over? The law of gravity, and thus we have plane crashes. So just because a plane is flying doesn't mean the law of gravity has been eliminated. It's just been neutralized by the law of lift. That is what we're talking about here. You still have with you today, and this is what Paul's trying to explain. What a wretched man I am. Right, if you're just sitting on the ground in a pile of metal, you can't move. You're paralyzed. The law of sin is here. But, and the problem, if you keep thinking the law is the answer, and you give yourself more laws, I'm going to stop being affected by gravity. I'm going to, whatever you're going to do is a pile of metal. You just keep getting frustrated because I, I'm trying really hard. I'm in, my, in my inner being, I want to fly. But I keep making rules, but I say, by tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'm going to be committed and I'll be flying. And you, it's like, it, you can't. The law of sin is there. But I've been justified by faith and I want to live for Christ. In my mind, Paul says, I'm a, I'm a slave to God's law. But in my members, I'm a slave of sin. Who's going to help me? Well, the law of lips is going to help, right? Or the law of life. And that's where chapter 8 is heading. There's another law here. You will never be unaffected by the law of sin. It's always going to be pulling on you. But you can neutralize this law of sin with the law of life and start flying, living in the spirit. And one of the things you need to know is the law of life. This is, this is revelation right here. The law of life, or the law of the spirit, is not the legalistic law. The principle that's going to get you above the law of sin and death is not more rules or more laws. It's going to be the life of the spirit. And so we begin, if you don't mind, chapter 8. And I want you to, the reason I'm doing this is I don't want you to lose track of this book. It would be nice if we could put it in a pamphlet instead of being a big, long book. Universality of sin... We're saved by faith in Jesus because Jesus died to sin. We're justified by faith, so grace is greater than sin. That doesn't mean you sin. It means grace is greater than sin. Sanctified, not by following the law, but by embracing this same life. But I've, although I'm trying to embrace this in my mind, I keep sinning. I keep sinning. I, I still feel sin. I'm being pulled by sin. Right, because you can't escape sin. But there is something you can overcome the law of sin with, and that is the law of life, which is the spirit. Chapter 8, here we begin. I'll go back to chapter 7, verse 30, or 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind, as a pile of metal, I'm a slave to God's law. I'm committed to God's law. But because of gravity, this pile of metal... But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. This pile of metal will still just sit here on the ground, or this pile of metal will just be stuck to, by, like gravity. I can't go. Verse 8, or chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just because you are still on the earth and gravity is affecting you is not condemnation. Just because you are a believer justified in Jesus Christ, trying to be sanctified, and you live a life, and you feel the pull of sin in your life, you're not condemned. You're a human living in time on this world before the glorification, glorification takes place. Everybody is going to feel the pull of sin, including Paul as an apostle. Therefore, there's, no, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't be condemned for that. It's like being condemned because the sun came up this morning and I see the sunlight. You have to. Unless you're blind. I mean, I'm affected by gravity. You have to unless you don't exist. So there's no condemnation for being human and being affected by sin in this world. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Let me read that in the more basic terms. Through Jesus Christ, 
the law of lift set me free from the law of gravity. In other words, you're always going to be affected by gravity. But Jesus Christ has taught you the law of lift, so start flying. And you realize if you stop flying, you're instantly going to feel the effect of gravity or sin again. For what the law, and again, the, the problem with this in the English sometimes is that word law. And so and again, even as I'm talking, I'm, I'm conf if you're listening to me, which you may not be, I understand that. But if you're listening, you say, oh, I'm getting confused because I say law, bad. And I say, this is what we want, law. This is bad, this is good. What is he talking about? And this would be the answer to that, changing this word law to principle. It's a principle of law, it's a, or it's a principle. And again, that's the idea here. I don't like to use the word principle on the board because it's harder to spell than the word law. <laughs> I, I know, simple mind, simple answers. Uh, so right here, if I read this again, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the principle of the spirit of life set me free from the principle of sin and death. For what the law, legalistic law, rules, was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. Paul goes back to chapter 7. There's nothing wrong with the legalistic law. When God, there's nothing wrong with God saying, this is what I expect you to look like. Okay, I'm going to try it. It's like, but you, you can't because you're weakened because you're trying to do it as a man. You're trying to be godlike as a human. It's like, I keep failing. Right. So there's nothing wrong with the law. It's something wrong with you. You have a sin nature. So let me help you. Stop looking at the law. Oh, so we're just going to forget the law and just keep on sinning? No. We're going to learn a new principle called the principle of life. We're going to learn to go to God instead of trying to imitate God through this law list. We're going to be transformed into his image. All of a sudden you're going to be by the spirit, by the renewing of your mind, by the word of God. You're, by this new life, you're going to start living like God without trying to have a standard. You're going to begin producing the nature of God instead of imitating this list of rules. <laughs> and that's what Paul's trying to say right here. It, I mean, this is a great book, I think. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, for what the legalistic law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man. He became one of us so we could become like him. Now that's going to be throughout the New Testament. He became sin for us so that we could join him in his nature. To, okay, uh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. And that's all going to take place through this new life. I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to just today, I'm going to just read through chapter 8, and then I'm going to come back next week and start breaking it down. I want to read through this whole concept, and just so you can see how it all, where it all goes. Okay? Are you with me so far? What we're talking about here? Sinfulness, justified, sanctified. We still got a problem. I tend to be sanctified, but I still got the sin nature. Paul's now introducing to you the, the spirit. If you look on the notes you've got, I should point this out. This is about this. This newness of life is about the spirit. And again, forgive me uh, for my negative attitude, uh, but I still feel so. The, the, the modern Western church has taken the word spirit, spiritual and made it so goofy that in one sense I want nothing to do with the spiritual. I want nothing to do with the spirit because it always ends up being weird and it always ends up closing this book and, and it finding the spirit. It's kind of like, whoa, no, it's, no, I don't think you should have to do that. But this book, chapter, well, look, look on, uh, oh, it's right here top third of the page right here, like the two-thirds mark. The Holy Spirit is the theme of this chapter. Okay? It's the theme of the chapter. The word pneuma, or spirit, is used 21 times in this chapter. Pneuma, the Greek word, means spirit. So this is about spirit. Pneuma, it mean, it's a Greek word, it means air. It means breath. It means spirit. 19 times of the 21 times it's used, it refers to 
the Holy Spirit. Now, you can figure that out yourself. The Bible doesn't necessarily say Holy Spirit, although sometimes it does. Sometimes when it says Spirit in the, in the Greek, it's just, it's just their letters are all the same size. So sometimes in your English translation, you make it a capital S Spirit for Holy Spirit, little s for human spirit. But then you've got to decide, is that the right translation? But nonetheless, it appears that 19 times of the 21 times Spirit is mentioned in this chapter, it's saying it's referring to God's Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned at a rate of once every two verses in chapter 8. Every two verses, it's basically, it's mentioning the Spirit. Now what's interesting is, I put this in parentheses, 15 times in verses 1 through 17 and 4 times in verses 18 through 39. 1 Corinthians 12, the great Holy Spirit chapter about the spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is mentioned every three verses. So in other words, the Spirit is talked more about in chapter 8 than it is in 1 Corinthians talking about the Holy Spirit and all the gifts. So keep that in mind. I just want you to notice that this is about the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy, about the Holy Spirit, but try to see something more than that mystical, magical Holy Spirit of the charismatic of the Western Church of... Now, here it is. Here we go. Now, I'm going to begin in verse, so I don't have to back up again. Uh, where am I at? Sinful nature. Um, in verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a, a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. So now instead of the sinful nature in every members of your body, you have something else inside of you, the Spirit of God, which we know. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Christ. Paul's eventually going to say that here in this book. You have the Spirit. And that Spirit is not necessarily just to speak in tongues and have visions, but what's it for? It's to live the sanctified life. That's why, I mean, Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that's a good key for a good idea. Holy Spirit. It's to help you live holy, which is another translation for the word sanctified, holy, set apart, the sanctified life. The Spirit is involved in tongues and prophecy and visions and all the spiritual stuff. But this chapter is about Holy Spirit is here so that you can overcome this problem of the sin is in all your members. Sin is in you, but the Spirit is also in you. So what? I'm going to have a vision. No, you're going to do what's right. You're going to do something that God would do. Oh, you mean like uh, walk on the water, raise the dead? No, like tell the truth. It's like, oh, I was looking for something a little more splashy. That's the problem. We're looking for splashy when God is looking for sanctification. Just live like God would live. Well, you know, I'm tempted with sin. That's because you're, yeah, you're going to be tempted by gravity. But you've got the law of lift in you. You can say, mm, I want to lie right here. I'm going to tell the truth. I want to do something wrong right here. I'm going to do what's right. You're experiencing the power of lift or the principle of lift. You're experiencing the principle of the Holy Spirit. It's like, well, that didn't really feel like the Holy Spirit. I didn't feel any tingling or anything. I didn't have a vision. It's like, no, but you rose above sin. You did so. Well, yeah, but and it, it was because of the law. Well, I never I make a list. No, I'm just going to know the heart of God. I'm going to know the mind of Christ. I'm going to know the standards. And I'm just going to execute what God wants me to do. Let's see if that's what's being said here. Verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Notice the mention of mind. That's what they're thinking about. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their, what a disappointing word, minds set on what the Spirit desires. Now we're right back to this. Is if your mind is set on what the Spirit desires, you're going to do what the Spirit desires. It's like, oh, yeah, it's just about, you decide. You know. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Now that's a huge doctrinal set of verses right there. 
You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. You have the sin nature in you, and you have the Spirit. But if your mind is set on sinful things and on the ways of the world, you're going to follow your sinful nature, including if you're in a church that's teaching law. I go to church all the time, and we're really focused on becoming God-like. How? Well, we, we've got a standard. Your mind is set on worldly things. Your mind is set on the things of, of the world, and you're going to produce sin. That's why people get in these cycles like, I just can't overcome this. Because you keep going back to this right here. The, you're not thinking like God wants you to think. You know, we're not talking about thinking positive thoughts, having your best life now. We're talking about understanding these principles. Um, you are ever controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God lives in you. The sin nature lives in you, but since you've been justified, again, th this is Paul's point here, and you're going to have to think about it, and I'll have to prove it more as we go. If you have been justified by faith, the Spirit of God lives in you. If you have been saved, if you've accepted Christ, and you've been born again, you can't be born again without the Spirit of God living in you. And that's what Paul is saying right here. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. In other words, he's saying, if you are a believer, you're not going to be controlled by the sinful nature, but you're going to be controlled by the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God lives in you. Then he says in this next verse, And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to Christ. So if you say, well, I haven't received the Holy Spirit yet, well, then you haven't been born again yet. But if you have been born again yet, then stop looking for the Holy Spirit. Get educated. You've already got the Holy Spirit. This happened with the uh, Ephesians when Paul came in and the John the Baptist believers, he came in through the interior road, he came in on the backside of Ephesus, he met some of John, uh, John the Baptist's disciples. And they accepted John's doctrine, but they didn't have the Spirit yet. They didn't know there was a Spirit. But they were committed to the Messiah, but they just hadn't heard the rest of the message. Once they were born again, the Spirit came in their lives. Very important verse. Okay, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Now that could be talking eschatologically sometime in the future, but it could be talking right now in the current situation of their, in 57 AD of their life or in our lives is you are now coming alive. You're dead to the law, but the spirit lives in you. You are now alive right now, not in the glorif glorification state, but you're now alive, ready to function. Otherwise, we would have to be just under the law of gravity or the law of sin, waiting, we just a pile of metal, just a pile of metal waiting to be redeemed or glorified. And then we're glorified, and now we do all these great things for God. I don't think Paul's talking about glorification. I think he's talking right now, he says, if your spirit is in you, you now are dead to sin, dead law. You now, with the spirit, are alive and able to live according to God's standard. You're able to rise up. Not in a glorified state, but you're able to rise up right now and live like a Christian. Or live like God would live. Again, I don't think it's eschatological. I think it's right now in the church age. I'm going to read the verse 10. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit of life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, which he is, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies right now in this current state through His Spirit who lives in you. It doesn't say give life and resurrect your mortal bodies. That's going to happen later. But right now in this state with sin in your mortal bodies, He's going to give life to these mortal bodies right alongside. Oh, yeah, but what about sin? He's not afraid of sin. The Holy Spirit is not intimidated by sin. He will conquer sin. He'll, just like the law of lift, is not intimidated by the law of gravity. You get me going fast enough, you get me in the right shape, gravity's not going to have any effect. We're going to fly right out of here. Well, what about gravity? Not worried about it at all if you get me in the right shape and get me moving fast enough. Well, what about the law of sin? I've got a sin nature, but not worried about it. You get me going in the right direction fast enough in the right shape, it's not going to be a problem. I'm going to rise above it. The law of spirit, the spirit of life is alive now. And we're not talking about the resurrection. We're talking about right now today. But the minute you go over here and start giving, well, here's our laws. You stop moving. You crash now right back into sin. Once you go to the law, boom, you go right into sin. Because you've stopped the momentum. Verse 12, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation 
but as not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if we live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Again, how do you put to get, how do you put death the misdeeds of the body? Not by giving yourself a law, but by hitting this speed of the law of the Spirit, you're going to rise above it. Um, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Another great verse. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, and the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I mean, God is now interested in you rising up and living like a son of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we might also share in his glory. Now, what just took place right here, he's talking about living now and suffering for Christ and living in this world as Christians, doing the right thing, but we're also going to have a future. Now, that's where this goes right here, it goes into the future. Now, just he just went eschatological there for a moment. So now, verse 18, I consider our present suffering of trying to live by the Spirit not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us when we're glorified in that final state. The creation waits the eager expectation of the sons of God to be revealed. And we're going on to that whole thing there about the future. In fact, the whole world is under bondage to sin, including you. The difference between nature, the world, the Gentiles, who are all under the bondage of sin, just like you, is you have placed faith in Christ, you've been justified in an attempt to help you be sanctified, God has sent the Spirit into you for you to rise above. The world is condemned. Nature is under bondage, waiting for Jesus Christ's return. The Gentiles are doomed. But you, because of faith in Christ, you can rise above this age and live like God. Now just imagine if all the Christians were living above the age that we are in, living not supernatural, spiritual, weird, goofy, mystical lives, but living holy lives in the power of the Spirit, rising above with the, with the principle of life, above the principle of sin, because of the momentum they had, because of the speed they'd attained, the shape they were in, their minds were set on this, it'd be a different world. And you wouldn't recognize it. Um, at least in the church world. I'm going to pray, and we're done. I appreciate you being here. We're going to clean this up next week. I just want to show you the sequence and where chapter 8 is, where it's coming from. And again, there's a lot of things. Where Paul's got a lot of questions to answer in chapter 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, in chapter 12, 9 and 10 and 11, a lot of questions are going to be answered there. Deep stuff. But then chapter 12, he goes right back to, after having explained all this, goes right into therefore. And starts talking about how you should live your lives. What does this look like? Now he gets into the actual application. This is the, the things that you should be looking for in your life. And set, set some, I don't want to say laws, but kind of identifying what this Christian life looks like, what, you're, what you've been empowered to do. Father, we thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We ask that we again would take these things to heart and allow the word of God to transform our thinking, to transform our minds, to help us keep things in perspective and not be forming idols and, and false images out of your truth, out of your reality. But Father, leaving these things in their pure form that we may be transformed into your image by the Spirit of God that is doing the work. Again, we thank you for this chance to meet and ask that we may attain to the things you've called us to do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your patience.